how did you come to think of it so in, in the course of your own careers? Well, at, the, at the time that I got into the field, uh, I was thinking of, of the, the, the overall context of uh, uh, of urban renewal and what it, what it meant, uh, but I think where we stand today, we need to, to think about the, the, the larger context that urban renewal uh, uh, played in what was shaping urban, urban America at that period of time. You've had uh, the urban areas of America, including right here in Connecticut, and we remember we're in, the, we're in the Northeast, the oldest cities in the country are here, they tend to be. Uh, smaller uh, communities, uh, uh, you know, scattered uh, throughout the state. Connecticut, so today, still has the largest city is about 160,000 Bridgeport. So it's the largest. It never evolved into the the larger cities, the Boston's, the, the you know, uh, cities of a half a million to a million, which are a different a different animal. So. Uh, um, there's, there's the flight, the, the big program at, at the time that really set the framework for federal government uh, funds in, in the United States was really the, uh, the interstate highway program. That was the big kahuna, if you would, at, at the time in terms of both dollars expended and, uh, and impact on the landscape. Um, in uh, retrospect, uh, the, the Interstate Highway Program and Coast Guard expansion, uh, those two acquired more property uh, and probably with a heavier hand than urban renewal, although I've read for uh, you know, 50 years how terrible urban renewal was. Many people have told me that uh, directly. Uh, but. Uh, the, the program was, was in, its, in its construct, was probably too simplistic. It was looking at uh, the physical features of, of a community. And it was looking at it from the lens of uh, traditional kind of uh, public projects. Uh, governments there to put out the fires, uh, public, public safety, build some roads, provide infrastructure. That was kind of the uh, agreed upon role of, of government. Uh, and now you're having a, a direct intervention in the uh, physical fabric of, of a community with, uh, uh, with, with the renewal program. Focusing just on the physical, that's, uh, as, as we said. Uh, Fixing the infrastructure and providing sites, um, and putting on those sites what a community would like to see happen, without really any um, any serious discussion with the private sector, who was going to provide the financing and, and do the construction. It was when you think about it, it was kind of naive because. A major partner in the process was missing from, uh, from the equation. Uh, the renewal program was, was quite formalistic in its feds. You got, your, you got a, three manuals provided how you conduct an urban renewal program. Uh, it was laid out, if you want to participate, this is what the community had to do. There wasn't much uh, opportunity for uh, uh, being creative, moving, moving off the path. Uh, the feds at that time had relatively uh, a large staff. They reached out and created a, a bureaucracy that, uh, that watched the local communities pretty uh, carefully. Um, I think there was uh, some distrust about the local communities having the, the wherewithal uh, uh, intellectually to, to run these programs. Uh, you know that that was certainly sensed by someone who was working at the local level. Um, 
Uh, the uh, so you're starting down a path where the ability to achieve the uh, uh, the goals of, of of the plans are you know are are, are, are limited. Um, on the other side of the equation, they did something that hadn't been done before, and that was the requirement that, that local communities create a planning infrastructure. Up to that point, it didn't exist. You did have, uh, you know, going back to the 1920s with kind of the advent of zoning. Uh, remember, it was open season up to that point from the founding of the country. You look at that in the context of a New London, you know, New London was around 100 years before there was the United States of America. So, you know, it had gone. The first urban renewal uh, director was Benedict Arnold, who burned the place to the ground. Uh, so, you know, in 1776, you started in 75, you're starting all over again. So there had been a, you know, a cycle already has, has, has occurred. Uh, but, um, the, uh, uh, the, the, the the structure of, of, of the city uh, 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 program, as I said, was was was, was formalistic, uh, highly regulated, and so you had to follow those uh, those requirements in order to uh, uh, go forward. Uh, every community. I learned this more after I left the city and became a private consultant working throughout the Northeast. It almost as if there was a, a stamp in each each town. The if you want to call it mistakes or at least a lack of of uh, achieving goals you see in, in urban urban community after urban community throughout uh, certainly the Northeast and probably throughout throughout the country. Uh, uh, the, the program ultimately those the inability to produce the desired result uh, morphed a whole bunch of changes which I'm sure we're going to you know we're going to get to talk to how it was was moderated I, I think one other point the, the program required a pretty large sweep I think communities probably would have um, preferred smaller projects, but the, uh, the Winthrop project was what, 140 acres in a, in a dense community like, you know, like London, that's, that's a big bite. Um, now, you know, uh, the focus is on, you know, maybe a block, a half a block, uh, re, uh, repurposing buildings, more appreciation for the built environment. This city has so much history, you trip over it every day, you don't, the, the appreciation of, of what he, is here is not, uh, you know, not, not right. even, even today, uh, our, our local citizens here, there's some who are passionate, but the majority do not uh, uh, really appreciate what's here. And at this time, there was like no appreciation the built environment. These, the program in London and elsewhere still was a product of a lot of public discussion and uh, ultimately referendums. Uh, uh, certainly city council votes, appropriation of, of funds. Small percentage of, of money went to the, uh, to the projects. From the, in, in terms of their context between state and local, uh, it was if there was a, a two or three percent city dollar cash contribution, that was a lot. And the, and the, the smarter cities used a, a provision within the within the urban renewal program that allowed credit for uh, other investments like building a school. Schools in London were over 100 years old. They're better at the time, but they they built a school that was in the district that uh, would uh, you know would, would would serve ultimately the uh, the build out of a, a redevelopment area. They could use that money. So it's like 
two dollars, you know, for one. So uh, London did uh, quite quite a bit of that, trying to to maximize its uh, its dollars. So all of that is the smorgasbord of, uh, of of kind of kind of the error, and we can get into you know get more detail. So I don't know if that helped or is that confusion. <laughs> I, I'm not quite as old as Phil. Uh, <laughs> Thanks. I'm getting there. But um, certainly urban renewal and urban renewal in London helped shape my own planning career, um, both from a personal sense and from a professional sense. Personally, um, my dad worked for the New London Redevelopment Agency uh, during urban renewal's heyday here in New London and went on to work for the Model Cities program, which we'll probably talk about during the course of this discussion. I, I'd like to just say hello to Mrs. Driscoll because her husband, C. Francis Driscoll, was my dad's boss at the New London Redevelopment Agency and went on to become the greatest city manager this city has ever seen. And in some ways, uh, was, was a hero of mine as, as I grew up professionally because I wanted to conduct myself like Mr. Driscoll did in public. Uh, my mom also happened to be a one-term city councilor um, in the early 1970s, um, again during a time when urban renewal uh, was happening. The Winthrop uh, project had already started and probably was completed, but I believe the Shaw's Cove urban renewal project was probably underway at that time. So I knew that my parents were public servants and they were trying to improve our life here in the city. And that's what interested me in becoming a, a city planner, a regional planner. Um, professionally, it's influenced my career in that, and I think Mr. Michalowski alluded to this, these federal programs resulted in municipalities recognizing they needed to have a planning function in City Hall. They needed to have professionals that were trained by professors of urban planning who would teach us, uh, I guess, to teach us how to avoid some of the mistakes of the urban renewal era. Phil mentioned that urban renewal primarily dealt with the physical or built environment. It uh, cleared blighted housing. It relocated highways along with the Federal Highway Act. And um, it provided monies for infrastructure, extension of utilities, et cetera. What it didn't recognize, or recognize well enough, that there's a human component to renewing municipalities. And, and there were, as, as Anna said, there were so many hundreds of folks displaced um, in the city of New and they had no voice in that displacement. Unfortunately, we lived it again, um, somewhat, during the uh, Kilo uh, case back in the 80s. So um, that's what the urban renewal era signifies to me. I didn't work really during that era. Um, it certainly influenced the work I do today, and the work I've done throughout my career. Um, but I think both panelists on either side of me have a lot more experience and a lot more knowledge. So the ball is in your court. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, thank you, uh, Anna, for including me and all of you for coming. Um, I do not know a lot about New London, um, but I have spent the last 14 years uh, researching and writing about the rule more broadly. So I guess I'm here for the larger context. Um, my book, Saving America's Cities, which Anna mentioned, um, is an effort to kind of shed some new light on what happened to cities in the second half of the 20th century. Um, and uh, I have came at it with uh, a feeling that historians had focused um, on the shift to suburbanization and all the changes that brought in residence and retail in, at, in work with you know, an implication that cities were suffering as a result, but very little investigation of what actually happened to cities. 
and what the pressure of suburbanization, which was on a massive scale nationally, really meant for cities. And a lot of attention went to the ways in which the federal government <coughs> had supported that suburban um, move with um, mortgage programs and the Highway Act um, and all of the other ways that we incentivized certainly white middle class people to be able to move to suburbs. And very little attention to what um, the federal government had done with cities. So that was where my entry point, and I decided to build the book around the career of a man named Ed Logue, who had worked from the early 1950s, where he started off in New Haven. During the 1960s, he moved to Boston. Uh, in the 1970s, late 60s, and into the mid-1970s, he headed a very powerful statewide urban renewal agency called the Urban Development Corporation, brought to New York State by Nelson Rockefeller. And then his last big job was in the South Bronx in the late 1970s to the mid-1980s, and he continued to work in the field until he died in 2000. So um, I wasn't so much trying to explain Ed Logue as use Ed Logue as a way to really get a handle on these changes. And some of the points that I um, try to make in the book that I think will come out in our discussion here are to try to get us to sort of um, step back a little bit from some of the oversimplification that I think has characterized urban renewal. Um, first of all, we tend to dismiss it with one brushstroke as one disaster without really looking at the ways in which it actually changed from the 1950s to the 1960s and into the 1970s. These people were not dummies. They learned from mistakes. They made changes. And looking, really taking that um, approach and understanding the way in which it evolved over time, I think, um, is very important. I also discovered that there were some progressive goals that may not have often been achieved or may have been misguided in certain ways, but some of the goals of people like Logue were actually quite admirable. They sought mid-income communities. They really were trying to figure out how to take on this kind of isolation across social class and race. Certainly Logue did. They weren't operating, as historians have suggested, according to the dictates of business. Um, in many cases, in a New Haven or Boston, business elites weren't the least bit interested in urban renewal nor really in the city itself. They were moving to the suburbs with the people. Um, so getting those business interests to reinvest in the city was part of the challenge. Um, there were some things they sought that we have still failed to achieve today like figuring out how to get metropolitan areas to work on urban problems together rather than to isolate into local authority. Um, and that still is very much challenging in this country. People are very attached to their local communities um, so that the problems of low income urban residents are rarely uh, shared in the metropolitan area. The solutions are rarely shared. Um, and so there are a number of issues like this. Architecture was really, uh, architects were really encouraged to think in a creative way about housing. Um, didn't always turn out as well as the developers hoped it might, but there was a kind of excitement about social housing in this country that we haven't seen since. Um, planning professions developed in the ways that were already mentioned. So I would, I guess, ask as we go into this discussion that we open our eyes a little bit and be um, a bit more flexible and not just um, dismissive uh, without really considering both sides of the equation and the achievements as well as the failures. Thank you. So I, I, um, Phil, you had mentioned that because of the wash remain fairly complex bureaucracy that the Urban Renewal Program had instituted in Washington, that many of the projects in cities were applied as though with a stamp. So there were broad similarities across the board, which is fascinating for, for a story to look at. But I'm curious if you think, um, and this is a question for everyone, that there was something particular about the way that urban renewal process was applied um, on the East Coast, in the Northeast, uh, in New London particularly, Well, the, the program rules were the same for, for 
the entire United States, so I don't think there was a, a, a particular regional stamp per se. There may have been, you know, in the architecture and, and how a community uh, considered getting involved in the first place and the debates that, that took place. Uh, you know, ultimately resulted in a political decision. We're going to go forward. We're going to try and use this vehicle. I mean, every municipality, I'm sure, in the United States doesn't feel that they have sufficient tax base to to address their address their issues. Uh, the you know that that probably was the case. I mean, uh, look at New London's history. This is kind of a tangent, but. You know, uh, London started its existence as a settlement, you know, you know, ranging from somewhere in uh, Rhode Island all the way through the Stony, uh, to Old Saybrook down to Colchester, okay? And every time the rural uh, uh, community, the farmers would collect and say, gee, we would want certain services, the town fathers would say, Chop off a piece of this and become your own town. It's your problem. We don't want to. And you know, in hindsight, those collected decisions over a couple of hundred years were really devastating because it it it, it whittled this community down to six square miles, which is probably never will be able to generate the kinds of revenue that can address the, the needs. You know, we're constantly saying the city spends too, uh, too much money. It doesn't spend enough to be able to provide the quality of life that, uh, that, is, uh, that should be here. As a larger area, you know, New England in particular, when we talk about regional differences, the rest of the country uh, operates in, in much larger geographic areas. You could take, uh, you know, their are counties in the rest of the country that are large as the entire state of Connecticut. In Connecticut's 169 cities and towns, and within towns there are there are jurisdictions, sub-jurisdictions that people will will take to the barricades if you talk about removing those powers. Uh, uh, Rotten's representative here, former town town manager is smiling because he's had to uh, deal with those kinds of situations. So, so you, you, have, you, you have that, that kind of situation. So the, the, the desire to be able to get a significant amount of money, I think Winthrop, uh, uh, I think, was a grant of around $30 million at that time. So that, that was huge. Uh, there was no way that a city could raise that kind, even if it wanted to bond. Probably didn't have the asset base to even bond that much, 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 uh, much money to to uh, to take on uh, a significant infrastructure uh, uh, project. So, um, so trying to reach out uh, uh, to to get those dollars was was a, was very alluring. Um, I think the requirements, you know, certainly for planning. At that time, also, you didn't have uh, most towns didn't have housing codes, uh, so uh, you know, you had no basis. So you had to put in place a, uh, uh, a the basic building codes, which 